What I never learned in school about the art of choreography is enormous. It's overwhelming. Not that school wasn't valuable and important, because school is very valuable, very important. That's where we get the hang of all the tools. And, you know, just metaphorically speaking, that's where we get comfortable holding the hammer in our hand. But when I got out into the real world, I found that it was a completely different ball game. In school, it's such a pristine environment. You have your beautiful studios and your well-equipped theater with all the lights, all of your classmates around you who are also good dancers, so that when you're working choreography, you're working with people who they all know the same kind of dance that you know. When you get out into the real world, it is so different. Now in school, I memorized all the rules. And what I found out when I got out into the field was, you really have to break those rules. In this video, I'm going to talk about three different scenarios that you could um, get work as a choreographer when you get out of your academic program. And I've also interviewed three different choreographers in each of those scenarios. The first being the dance studio, or the dancing school, as the kids call it, where you have all kinds of ages, all kinds of levels, and you've got a recital to do at the end of the year. The second is the world of commercial choreography, where you go to work for someone else, um, say in television or choreographing commercials or industrials. And the third area I want to talk about is the practice of becoming an autobiographical choreographer, the practice of using intuition, and believe me, intuition is something we never talked about in school. Before we talk about any of those, though, we're going to talk about charting music, because no matter which venue you are in, one of the most important things you can do right off the bat is chart your music. Let's look at how we would do that. Let's chart some music. Now, I know everybody probably already knows how to do this, and it's very remedial, but we're going to do it anyway. So, here we go. My introduction. Now I'm starting into my first verse. This was the introduction. Third count of A. I'm just counting A. God's gonna trouble. Four counts of A. Here I go. Five counts of A. This is what I do on a little, you know, piece of notebook paper. Good. Now this music is going to change dramatically. Right here, I go into my little hip hop section. Second count of A. That's what's spoken. Oh, children, bad women, back to the light mind. Here I go, my fourth count of A in my little hip hop section. World's gonna turn until it ends. Now I know that these are going to be very contrasty because one has a lyrical quality, one has sort of a hip hop quality. And I see I have eight counts of eight there. Here I go with my words again. It's more like the chorus. Here's three. My guess is I have four more. This piece of music is really very even. All the counts are in four four times, counting up to eight. It goes back and forth from the verse to the chorus. Yep, here we go again. I've got another hip hop type of uh, first going on. What can you do and this is a very even song. There are going to be eight of them, eight phrases. Joshua Jericho, one of a five. Six. I'm going to switch. Seven. And eight. Back to my lyrical wave in the water. I know this is going to be lyrical. Up. And usually, when I'm doing this, I write little notes to myself. There's going to be four more, I know, because I know the song. And here's the third one. Good. Now I know my music's going to fade out. I have four phrases to fade out. And this is how you chart your song the first time through. 
That was my first time listening through. Now I might have to listen three or four times in order to get all my little notes on here. This is what my little notes might be. I know this is my intro. I only have one count of eight for my intro. And then I have that whole wade in the water thing. These are just little notes I give to myself. And then I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight phrases of that. How convenient. Then I know I go into my little hip hop section. I'm going to call that HH. And I know I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I don't know what happened here. My pen touched the paper accidentally, so uh, don't look at that one. We have eight. Then I know we went back to Wade in the Water. I know I went back to my lyrical. I had eight, and I went back to my hip hop. I had eight, I went back to Wade. And this is gonna be my fade out. And here's my little sign for fade out. I give myself just a little symbol. So after I get this all figured out, I start to think, wow, how can I contrast play with all these phrases and start building my dance. Well, I know I only have eight counts for my intro, and then I have to hurry up and get people on. And remember, when we are doing choreography, we want it to always be an integrated whole, and we always want to start with some kind of introduction. Well, in this introduction, I only have one count of eight. So I'm going to have to be a little tricky in here in order to build my introduction in here. So once you have your chart made up, I'll tell you how I usually do it. It's so practical. I think, okay, I'm meeting my dancers today. I'm going to make up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm going to make up eight counts of eight of a lyrical type of combination. I'm not even going to worry about this other stuff yet. I'm just going to go eight counts of eight and I'll make up my lyrical combo. Now when I make up my combo, I'm going to put level changes in it because I know me and what I like to do is a lot of canon, a lot of manipulation. We're going to talk about that. And it really helps to have level changes. So I'm going to make up my first eight counts of eight, and then I meet my dancers. When I meet my dancers, I teach them the compo, and then I start experimenting and playing with it. At the end of my day, I have figured out that I want to use lines right here. And I'm going to have a dancer. This is my first formation. I'll have a dancer here. I'll have two dancers here. And I'll have one, two, three dancers here. This, she's got her own line. They've got their own line, and they've got their own line. So I look at that, and I think, hmm, looks kind of sparse. I have an idea. Every time I hear this wade in the water, wade right there, there's another one, wade right there. Every time I hear that, I'm going to have a theme. I'm going to have something reoccur. So what I decided to have reoccur is I'm going to have like a backdrop of dancers every time I hear wade. And the back drop of dancers they're going to have on huge skirts and they're going to wiggle their skirts or move their skirts so it, it's water like it's very flowy so I've already decided that every time I hear this those girls are coming on with those big skirts but I want to contrast it so oh I know these dancers here will have a different type of costume they'll maybe be in little short little short um, uh, what do you call those paddle pusher pants so I've already got a contrast going on. And after my first day, I've already got this figured out. Now, I really like to use a lot of different levels, like I said, and I've put them here. So as long as I have levels going on, I'm not so worried about this phrase anymore. I know it's going to work. And I can go on to my next phrase. Next time I have class, I've got eight counts of eight, all choreographed for my hip hop section. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm only on this section now. And I've got this mapped out, and I see this, and I go, well, you know what? I don't want to do um, lines coming in on levels, because I've already done that. So I'd better think of something else. So on my hip hop section, I'm going to get rid of these girls. Because it's not saying wait in the water. They only come on when I hear wait in the water. I'm going to get rid of those girls. And these down here, I'm going to put them in a formation. What do I like? Well, I love bowling pins. I think I'll try it. So I make a little bowling pins formation down here. And I try it with them. And it looks great. I keep it. But the unison of the hip hop section goes on too long. So after one, two, three, four, I'm going to 
I'm going to break it up into a canon. So I've already got that figured out. I'm going to go into canon right here. Change it. Come on down. And the next time I meet my dancers, I know I'm going to have those same dancers doing that same exact th thing on Wade in the Water, but I need another lyrical combo. Should I make up a new one, or should I use this one over here and just manipulate it? Oh, I'll make up a new one, see how it goes. So I make up a new one. The new one I decide, it has to be on a different level from this one. So my next lyrical combination, I'm going to have it all on the floor. So I make up my lyrical combination all on the floor for this, and I see that that really doesn't work. It's just a bunch of stuff on the floor, and even though these girls are standing up, still didn't work that well. So I know this combination, my combo one, it wasn't on the floor. Maybe I can have my combo one and my combo two at the same time. So it worked. It looks fabulous. I have some dancers doing combo two on the floor while other dancers are doing combo one standing and I have my wade in the water girls in the back. So when I come back I go, great, that worked. And it worked in lines. So over here I just make a note to myself that on this verse I use lines. I've used lines, I've used bowling pins, I don't want to do those again. So I've got them mapped up that I've done that. All right, back to my hip hop. The next time we meet, it's hip hop combo again. Do I want to use this first one again or make up a whole new one? Well, I'm not really that great at making up hip hop stuff. I'm way better at lyrical stuff. But then I don't want it to be redundant, so, oh, I know. The first two counts of eight will be different. These two, then I'm going to use combo one again. I'm just going to change it so it's not so recognizable. What can I do? One of my very favorite formations, I already know this, so I'm going to try it today in class, is I'm going to have some feature dancers. I'll have some feature dancers in the middle here dancing, and the rest of my dancers, I'll make a circle of dancers around my feature dancers, and this circle, they can do something else not so noticeable, just sort of supporting my two feature dancers doing the hip hop. So I'm going to have those brand new, the brand new two phrases. I'll have those in unison because I want everyone to see them. I spent a lot of time working on those two phrases since I'm not that great at hip hop. So I want everybody to see these. These will be in unison and then I'll go into my formation. I'll use this combo over here. I don't have to make up something new. Great. Okay. Time for wade in the water again. Here comes my girls in their white dresses. They're all in the backdrop, but you know, I've already done that twice, so I need a little variation here. When I get to my map, you know, when I'm reviewing it, I go, hmm, need a little variation. So I'm going to let these girls stay on a little bit longer and be seen, because really, they didn't get to be seen very well, much so far. I'll let them be seen a little more, and the girls that are on stage, I'll put them at other levels so we can see the variation on my, on my Wade girls back here, in the back, in the big skirts. So now it's time to wrap up my number, and I know that the end of my number has to be sensational because Doris Humphrey says in her book that the end of your dance is 40% of its impact. So I want my, the end of my dance to be spectacular. I know I'm going to do some really nice uh, changes in formation. So I've experimented with these girls and they've always been in lines like this at the back of my stage. I'm going to somehow get them in line like this. So my Wade girls, they've always been at the back. Now I'm going to bring them into a line in the center. I really want them to be seen, those girls in the dresses. So I have to do something else with those girls in the pants. I know, they'll go down to a, a low level. They'll be on the sides of these girls, but they'll be at a lower level, and then these girls will be seen. So then I make up some choreography that supports that little strategy that I have. And in the end, I want to make a really strong shape. I know from composition that a very strong shape is a triangle. So at the very end, I'm going to have my girls in dresses be a triangle this way, and then I'm going to have my girls in the pants be a triangle this way, an opposing triangle. So I have a triangle this way and a triangle this way. 
Now I've got my map. And I keep my map for posterity, even though my dance is all done, so that I can review sometime when I want to put this all back together, how I came to my whole incorporated piece. First, let's talk about the scenario of the dance studio or the dancing school. When I first got my dance studio, I was so naive. I had a hundred kids and teens and adults, and I had a, um, a recital to do at the end of the year. There must have been 20 dances that I knew I had to put together. Now, in school, we're really taught not to be formula choreographers. And you know what I figured out when I had my dance studio? better get some formulas or you're never going to make it to the end of the year. So I'm going to tell you about some of my little tricks, some of my little formulas. The first thing I want to say about getting your studio together, getting your structure, and getting your formula is get a curriculum. This is my curriculum guide. Now, when I was at the University of Hawaii, I put together a curriculum, a three-year curriculum for the university. Then, I just had it in some drawer. Then, when I got my dance studio, I figured out, oh my gosh, I need a curriculum, but these are kids, what should I do? I know, I'll treat them just like they're college students, and I'll give them the exact same curriculum I had at the University of Hawaii. So I sort of rewrote my curriculum for my studio so that all my teachers followed this curriculum. Now, I have one, if you don't, and of course you can get this from me, but I would advise you, if you're not going to get this one, write your own curriculum. I can't tell you how valuable it is, not only in running your studio, but in choreographing your numbers. Let me tell you how it works to have a curriculum. For instance, in this book, I have 10 lessons. And by the 10th lesson, let's say the kids came in January, and now it's December. I know from my curriculum which vocabulary steps all of the kids know how to do. Let's look at a little formula, a little project I would do with the kids, and then I'll get a nice piece of choreography out of it. Okay, we're going to pretend like we're in Jazz 1 class, and my students started Jazz 1 in September. They danced September, October, November, and December. Now it's time in January to start thinking about the recital. Now, I know because I have a curriculum that they have already learned certain skills. So, I'm going to ask my class to sit down, and I put my, my little poster board up on the mirror, just like this with my magic marker, and I say, okay, you guys, let's talk about all the, the steps that we've learned so far. And they'll say, oh, we learned how to walk on the beat. Tip walk. Great. Let's put it right here so you can remember. Tip walk. And I write it down. And this chart stays on the mirror all day. What else do you know how to do? Oh, we know how to passe. Oh, okay, you know how to passe. I'm going to put it over here, and I'll tell you why later. What else do you know how to do? Oh, we know how to passe walk. You know, that's this little step I do with them. One, two, three, passe. One, two, three, passe. And they walk across the floor saying, great, you know how to passe walk. What else do you know how to do? Well, it goes on and on. They know how to pivot. They know, oops, pivot goes over here. I'll tell you why sooner or later. Let's just go pivot walks. You know, walk for and then pivot. They know how to do that. They know how to chasse. They know how to, they'll tell you all these things. They know how to do a double up. Double up is in my curriculum and it looks like this. Double up, it's a jazz one. A little jazz one thing we do. Clap your elbows. Okay, they know how to double up. What else? They know how to double down. Double down is one, two. It's like a little hip, hip isolation thing. They go down like this just to teach rhythm. Great, my jazz one class. They know how to double down. What else do you know how to do? Oh, they know how to do a two-step turn. We've learned two-step turns. What else? We go on and on until we list all the vocabulary that they know how to do. And you know what? By the end of Jazz 1, the, there's big lists. They know how to do lots of things. So then, the next thing that I do with them is say, the difference between these kind of steps 
and these kind of steps are these kind of steps are the ones we do across the floor. We do our tip walks across the floor, we do our passe walks across the floor, we do our chasses across the floor. These are called locomotor movements. So we put it up here, locomotor. These steps over here are steps that happen in place, like a passe or a pivot or a double up or a double down or a two-step turn, it's kind of in place. It, it is locomotor a little bit, but I put it on this side. These we're going to call axial movements. So they already know the difference between locomotor and axial. They get it. Locomotor is the stuff they do across the floor. Then I divide them up into little groups. And I say, don't be intimidated because you already know so many steps. And by the time we're done with the chart, believe me, the steps are all the way down here. There's, there's so much they think of. So in your group, I want you to make up, let's say, four counts of eight. And I want you to make up your own dance. They love it. And it's not intimidating because every time you get stuck, just look over here. You know how to do all these things. You can start putting them together. Now the one thing that your combination has to have is it has to have a locomotor movement bring you on to the stage. Then you do your four counts of eight combination with all these things that you know how to do. And then your locomotor movement takes you off of the stage. So on the first day of the exercise, I put on the music and the kids go to it. Now it's the next week, and they've all come back to class, and hopefully they've all had sleepovers at each other's houses, and they've all practiced their little dance combinations. And I told them, I want you to get together with your friends at school or whatever. Practice your combo. Practice your dance. So they've got it down by the next time we come. So the next time we come to class, we're going to start talking about spatial relationships. They don't know that. Here's how we talk about it. Okay, here's a group of five dancers, you know, out of our class. Okay, Julie and Betsy, you five, do your dance for us. And they're going to get up and they do their dance and they don't even think about it. They're just like randomly spread around the studio. So then we say, will you do your dance again, the five of you? But you know what? Let me line you up. I'm going to line you up, you five dancers, in the shape of a W. And they do their dance. The next group, oh, we want to do it, we want to do it. Okay, you guys get up and do it, but you're not going to do a W. You're going to, here's, here's dancer number one, dancer number two, dancer number three, here's Julie, here's Betsy. You five, you're going to do it in the shape of a diagonal. They all do it. Next group comes up. What's our shape? Okay. Your shape, dancer one, I just sit, get their little bodies and put them there. Dancer one, two, three, four, five. Your shape is going to be the shape of a circle. So when you do your dance, never come out of your circle. And of course, we go through it with every single group. Then we have the shape of an X. It goes on and on. You can make up all different kinds of shapes. So then I say to them, I'm going to give you the rest of the day today to do your dance again. But this time, you come on and you have to have at least, let's say, three of these kind of shapes. Like, let's say you're going to come on and do your dance in the, you know, your first kind of eight in a W, then somehow you have to get yourself into the diagonal, and then somehow you have to get your group into the circle, and then somehow into the X, whatever other shapes we have come up with, you know, and there'll be lots of them. Oh, I want to be. Uh, a Z. Well, it looks a lot like an X, but just let them think, oh yeah, a Z. That's cool. So they get into their little shapes and exit. They have the whole rest of the day to do it, and they come up with some great little combos. Now maybe that was a little bit too advanced for a beginning class to ask them to do three or four different shapes in their combo. Maybe they're just going to do one shape, like a V, and they have to stay in the V the whole time. With older kids and more advanced groups, you can ask them to, to change shapes. But with the beginners, pretty much they can decide what shape they want to stay in for their whole dance, and you can't have the same shape as somebody else. So you're going to be the W, you're going to be the circle, you're going to be the V, you're going to be the, the Z or whatever. So they all have their own shape. Then it's time to compose the dance that's going to be in the recital. This is how I do it. I bring everybody in in rows. 
So let's say I have 20 something people. They're all coming in in rows. I'm not going to draw 20 dots. It takes forever. But you know what I mean. You have all these rows and they come on with a locomotor movement or maybe they're already on stage and they do their dance. Now my very first group, let's say they were the V. So maybe this dancer, this dancer, this dancer, this dancer, let's just say this dancer, maybe they're like this, right? This is going to be my first group, the V. After I've brought everybody up on and they do my combo, I make up a, a combo, four counts of eight, everybody has to do my combo. Then after my combo that everybody does together, everybody gets to do their own. Well somehow I get rid of all these dancers and only the V combination is on doing their dance. When they exit, while they're doing their chasse or their locomotor movement on, the O combo is coming. Then they exit, the X combo comes on. And they're doing their own choreography this whole time. Maybe you have the W come on, five or six groups all in their shape. Then guess what happens? Everybody comes on again in these rows, just like the beginning. Everybody does my combo. One more time, we hit a pose, the dance is over. You've got a whole dance made up now that lasts for five minutes. Everybody gets to dance an ensemble. Everybody gets to be seen. Everybody gets to conclude with the ensemble one more time. And when I do this one, I make sure whoever was in the back row here gets to be in the front row here. So everybody gets to be seen. This is a great tactic for your Jazz One class. You get a whole dance out of it. So you can see that even with my beginning students in a dance studio situation, I start teaching my students about the elements of choreography very early on because I know I'm going to need them to help me out. Of course it would be ideal if I could do all the choreography myself, but there's there are times when I need material and I need it now. And so I turn to my students and go, you know how to choreograph. You help me out here. And I give them little assignments. Let me show you some things I've had to pull out of my hat with these little assignments. First of all, I don't think I need a lot of material. I'm very comfortable with making up a simple combo and then playing with time, space, and energy aspects and let the piece kind of finish itself. For example, here is a simple combo I choreographed for Amazing Grace. It lasts for just one verse. So for the first verse of the song, I have a solo dancer perform it. In the next verse, I bring on five more dancers in canon. And they all just perform the same combo. But because of the level changes and the directional changes, the piece tied together well. Actually, I'm very big on just making up a very limited number of combos and then changing them with the time, space, and energy tools. For instance, this number to Swing Low Sweet Chariot won the highest score of the day at a recent competition. And it looks very complex and kaleidoscopic. But in reality, it is only two short combinations. It is just the changes with the time and the space that we talked about in the first video that makes it look like so much more. I give dancers assignments. And truthfully, there are times when I'm just at my wit's end and I give the choreography over to the dancers. In this number from my show, Lay Jazz Hot, I put the dancers in small groups and told them, you have four counts of eight to get across the stage. Make it cute, make it campy. And they did it all in about 20 minutes of class time. So I lucked out and I got eight counts of eight staged in less than a half an hour. Cheating? Well, maybe, but I'll tell you, it works for me. And I've done way, way more cheating than that. Let me tell you, like last year, I was choreographing a Cat Stevens suite. I loved the song The Wind by Cat Stevens, but I just didn't have time to choreograph it. So I gave my class one whole class to each come up with their own eight counts of eight. It had to change levels and move from one side of the stage to the other. They came up with some lovely combinations that I looked at individually and then I staged the combos together. I did come up with four counts of eight 
on my own and I put that in the middle of the dance so I could bring the dance together in unison for a moment but other than that the piece was all my students doing and it came out very very nice another thing I'm very big on is recycling now I'm sure I wouldn't have the nod of my college professors on this one but you know I just didn't feel like I needed to reinvent the wheel every time a recital came along let me show you some of my recycling tricks I first choreographed this combination for my video Modaz it was very lighthearted very joyful in nature you can see there is a lot of tension and release and even though there is a lot of tension and release the piece keeps its very free and easy attitude later I recycled the material to be more of a serious number a solo to the song Joan of Arc by Leonard Cohen I changed the attitude to one that was more somber and even though the choreography was the same the dynamics were very different the next year I took the same choreography and designed it as a group piece now as a group I could use the tools we talked about like time space and energy choreographed to the music of Cat Stevens the piece looked entirely different this jazzy little number was in my holiday show making spirits bright a few years ago I choreographed it to Rosie O'Donnell's snappy version of Santa Claus is coming to town the next summer I found a cute version of it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing and just as a passing thought I asked the dancers to try their Santa dance to this new song we were really just fooling around at first but I found that choreography fit the new song exactly so presto a new dance was born and recostumed most of the time it's not the whole dance that I recycle but I do recycle a lot of motif movement I'm sure you will see the similarities and reuse of particular moves in these clips things like the prayer hands and the combre circle with the head roll these are movements or gestures that I would refer to as motifs another one of my favorite ways to recycle is not so much to use the material itself but to use patterns and formations recycle those for instance I have a pattern that I call hot lunch I love to use my hot lunch pattern and when I say to my students okay at this point in the dance we're going to do hot lunch they all just like get into place they know exactly what the hot lunch pattern is I use the same pattern I might vary or change the material now in my videotape the anthology of staging information I explain all about hot lunch so let's take a look at that clip all right here's how hot lunch works usually in hot lunch I'll first have the rows go to the right and the left so they do the right left thing like this and they're in canon don't have to but it looks neat then these dancers come forward now your first dancers are the most important dancers coming forward and I always have them coming forward in some big sens sensational way like chasse step leap you know they're gonna do some big thing or kick or they do something big as they're coming forward these guys are gonna go come through eight counts later but what am I gonna do with these guys I gotta get them out of the way they come down they move over and they start on their way back now you see they're starting on their way back so these guys coming down look they're gonna bump into them so these guys they have to kinda move over a little bit to come through here is the original hot lunch staging with Bontmans and Jete Leaps coming forward and a little shuffle going back in another piece I used the same patterning but I used a passe jump instead of a leap a split to the floor instead of a squat and a sit roll to travel back instead of a shuffle back so you can see the similar pattern I just changed the movements the big explosive movement coming forward the drop to the ground when arriving downstage and the moving back to the upstage as others were coming through those are the things I changed in this more lyrical piece I used the same hot lunch staging pattern with a double passe coming forward a straight leg sit roll on the floor and a step tap going back so you can see I'm just recycling my pattern of staging and I'm varying the movement 
Another thing we really never discussed or talked about in my academic study was the use of building characters within a dance piece. Now, of course, of course we studied musical theater and we, and we choreographed dances for musical theater. We had a musical theater unit. But I'm talking about inventing your own characters within a piece so that you can vary your characters slightly, give them theme and variation, give them variations on the theme according to what's going on in your piece. Build personalities, give them different motifs, maybe even a little bit different costuming. This gives different groups of dancers in your piece different personalities and it makes it really fun for the dancers and really fun for the audience. For example, in my Nutcracker All Jazzed Up, the Waltz of the Snowflakes is a very long number and I thought it would be nice to break it up with different characters. So I invented the Foo Foo Snowflakes, the very jazzy icicles, and the Caribbean snowflakes. It was fun because it was out of the ordinary and no one expected it. The Foo Foo snowflakes were very balletic in nature. They had a very soft and lyrical feel to them. The icicles were jazzy. They were just very saucy, very percussive. The Caribbean snowflakes well, I have a little Caribbean beat going on in the music. So what I did was I put him in a little bit of a Caribbean looking costume with the bra tops and the head pieces. Usually my Snow Queen was in a tutu, but last year I made her a Las Vegas showgirl and she brought down the house. I did something similar with the Waltz of the Flowers in that it turned out to be flowers from around the world with their own personalities and styles, such as the wild flowers. They were very lyrical and had a bit of a ballet vocabulary. Here are my baby's breath and my roses that make up the baby's breath and rose bouquet. They're very elegant. Then I brought in my Mexican poinsettias. And you can see I used a lot of Latin feeling steps. Oh, and this one is fun. Here's Lotus Blossom from the Far East. And we can't forget about the star of the Waltz of the Flowers, Miss Dewdrop. She was just like a princess. When I choreographed this number to Birdland, I did lots of characters. Birdland was a cabaret lounge in New York owned by Charlie Parker, and so much of our American jazz heritage was born out of that nightclub. The dance started with these characters, which are like the master of ceremonies. Here you see the musicians, and the dancers in the back represent the nightclub audience. Just for fun, I introduce a sort of maestro character, and he directs these dancers across the stage, which I was thinking of as musical notes. And of course, in the conclusion of the dance, I bring everyone together for a big bang of an ending. Another thing I want to touch on about choreographing for your dance studio is the fact that you're going to have to compromise your choreographic vision because everybody needs a chance to be in the front. Let's face it, all the kids are paying tuition, all the parents are going to be at the recital, and you have to have some strategies that bring everybody to the front at least once so that everybody's happy. Let's take a look at some strategies I've come up with. Number one, the jazz one game. We already saw how we can do this by letting dancers make up their own routines and then you stage them. Number two, crossovers. Crossovers are always good because everyone has a chance to do their little stint and you can even ask them what little trick they might know, what they think they might be good at. This makes everybody happy because they get to do something that they think they're good at and they get to be alone on stage for a minute or at least in the front row. Number three, the feature dancer. This is a strategy I really like. I create small features for the dancers, maybe only one or two counts of eight for each, but each dancer gets a chance to leave the group perform a feature, and then return to the group. Actually, this is a choreographic technique that I don't think of as a compromise to keep everyone happy. 
I really do like the visual results and the flow. Number four, hot lunch. And don't forget about your formations. Like the old hot lunch trick where everyone gets a chance to bolt with explosive energy right to the front of the stage. Number five, peel aways. Another sure bet is the peel away, where you peel off the front rows and reveal the dancers that were in the back. Here the dancers in the back are revealed and they get a little feature. That way, those dancers don't mind being in the back for a minute or two. But what about those other dancers that were in the back? Well, they go around the stage quickly and they enter in the front wing right in front of those feature dancers. So now they are in the front row. And on this dance, I made super sure that everyone not only got to dance in the front row, but bow in the front row and hear the cheering from the audience. You can see that I just blatantly made the rows switch during the dance so that every parent could see their dancer in the front row. I know it is sometimes very compromising to adjust your choreography so that everyone is seen equally. But when you are in the dancing school business and want to stay in the business, it's a choreographic necessity. You have to have a lot of tricks up your sleeve and make sure your choreography accommodates all of your clientele. Now to conclude this little segment on choreographing for your dance studio or dancing school, we're going to hear from Audrey Durrell. Audrey runs a very successful school of dance for children. As a child, I trained in various ballet schools throughout this country and abroad. As an adult, I went to university, but nothing I learned in those ballet schools or at university prepared me for working with children and becoming the director of a children's dance company. Basically, I learned through trial and error and through 12 years of making mistakes. So now I'm going to share with you a couple of the ideas that have really uh, come to be very sound and that I rely on. The first is, when I am choreographing for children, I always try to have a message or a storyline. I think this is important because in today's world, there is a lot of meaningless entertainment on TV and in the movie theaters, and I think people really search for meaning and message in life. Because I work with the children for an entire school year, I think it's great to have a message like never give up or reach for your dreams or search and you shall find, something like that. The way I come to these ideas is by reading folk tales or children's stories, listening to music, watching movies. Uh, here's how I came to one of my latest ideas. I was listening to the radio and I heard a song, a beautiful Polynesian song, and I thought, I'd really like to do a show about Polynesia. So I took a Polynesian myth and I changed the principal character to a girl. The story tells about a tribe of people, of Polynesian people, who lived on a volcanic island. The volcano explodes and the people are forced to flee. They travel across the ocean and in their search for a new home, they experience many hardships and adventures as well. At the end of the show, they do find a new home that's even better than the one they left. And the theme of this show was about how family can help you get through hard times and about how if you're persistent and keep looking, you'll find what you seek. So there are a couple of subtexts there. A couple of people who are really key to me in my preparation for a show are my sound man, and he is actually someone who helps me put together a soundtrack. The soundtrack for me is the glue that holds the show together. Now because I'm doing a narrative, I can't have stops and starts or blackouts. The whole thing has to be a continuum and flow together. So what I do is select music that I know I'm going to use for my background. And then I always have that music provide the transitions between the pieces. Oftentimes there will be a short voiceover over the transitional music that will help to explain key uh, changes in the storyline. Another key player is my lighting designer. He creates all sorts of marvelous effects with colored lights and with the help of a drawer full of gobos, we can create textures, different scenes, and light plots that really enhance the show. Most choreographers don't want to work with the babies. By that, I mean the seven-year-olds to about age 10. 
I don't let the kids on stage until they're seven because I feel that prior to that it can be almost a traumatic experience sometimes. So I really want it to be a joyous experience. So at about age seven they start. But I might have ten dances for seven to ten year olds that I have to choreograph. In order to avoid uh, monotony and everything being exactly the same, I'll give myself an assignment for each dance. Like for one, I might say something like, okay, in this dance I'm going to use very percussive, angular movement that's going to s travel on vertical and uh, diagonal lines and it's going to have sudden freezes and call and response. So I make a chart with all of the dances that I have to complete and give myself an assignment for each dance so that I don't fall into the monotony trap. What I used to do, and it was a huge mistake, was I would choreograph all the steps first and that would always get me into trouble because I made things much more difficult than they really needed to be. It's really important that you, the first thing you do is listen to your music a lot and then make a map. And you all know how to make a map, you just have the introduction. By the way, if there's not already a nice slow introduction in my music, I edit one in because I think it's really important to set the stage slowly with that introduction. So you have your introduction, you have your verse, your chorus, your verse, your chorus, your break, your crescendo, and then your climax or your ending. And I like to have a button on my ending, if possible. And I edit that in too. So, um, what's wrong with doing the steps first? Well, this works better. I'll tell you how to do it. So you have your music and then you make a map. You decide beforehand who you're going to bring in in the intro and what you're going to do in the chorus and in the verse and in the break. So what I do is I just decide for example, that I'm going to use certain stage patterns in each one of these sections and that the chorus is always going to be unison movement. There's a crescendo in the music usually and you can bring all of the dancers back on stage and have them finish together. If possible, it's nice to have younger dancers end in a pose so that they can feel the outpouring of appreciation and applause from the audience. When you're choreographing for students, whose parents are paying tuition, there are a couple of things you really have to pay attention to. One is, is that every student has to pass the front of the stage at some point in the dance. Another is that all the dancers deserve equal stage time. My dance classes tend to be rather large. I might have 20 to 25 young students in a class. Because of this, I almost always have to deal with multi-levels. That is to say, students who can just do a pivot and those who can do a double turn in the same class. So there are a couple of ways I might deal with this. One is I would choreograph two completely different sections, one that's very simple and one that's more complex, and have them be performed either simultaneously or at different times in the piece. Another way is that I would have all the students learn the simple section and then have some of the feature dancers learn a more complex section. But it's really important to bring all your dancers to the front, not just the best ones. One way that I might use all of my dancers and have them all be in the front at some point is to start out a dance like this. The dance has an appetizer, a main course, and a dessert. So in my appetizer, I might just feature some of my strongest dancers, bring some of the strongest dancers on for the very beginning and have them introduce a theme. Then in the verse, bring in the bulk of the dancers, because usually you have a, a larger group who are more remedial. So I'll bring them in and have them do a basic theme, a more simplified version of the complex theme. That way you can have both groups at the, at the front. Now when I have that large group, I can bring, I can do a peel off by bringing the back rows, either peeling them off through the front or having them travel through to come to the front, or having the front rows exit and the back rows come forward. So at some point, their parent in the audience is going to see their little dancer right up in front. And so they can have that in their video, they can freeze it as a photo, blow it up and put it on their mantelpiece. That's really important for everyone. If you do this, you will be sure to have very satisfied parents who will bring their dancers back to you year after year. Let's go on and talk about commercial work. Commercial work can be particularly challenging because most of the time, the choreographer doesn't get to pick the music, doesn't get to pick the dancers, doesn't get to pick the costumes, and doesn't get to pick the location. And sometimes the locations are just 
big obstacle courses. What you get to do as the choreographer is be hired by someone else to do a job and if you want to keep your job you need to please the people who hire you. Let me show you some of my adventures in the wonderful world of commercial choreography. This one's funny. Right out of college, I was hired as the dance director of an art center in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, and they wanted outside performances in the park. Well, here's what I learned about that. First of all, don't choreograph material that's too fast in tempo when you're outside, especially if you're on the grass. Don't choreograph dances that go down to level one or two. You'll get grass and dirt all over you, and maybe it will even be raining like it is here, and that dirt's going to stick to your tights. Try to stick to choreographing more performance art types of numbers if you have to be outside, more gestural than technical. Here is one of my next commercial gigs where there was a city grant to hire a choreographer to enhance the tourist season with performances. Well, the site turned out to be outside, super small, brick floor where the audience was everywhere. For a situation like this, you have to be prepared to change directions a great deal because the audience is in the round, so to speak. You also have to have good, enthusiastic dancers with a good sense of humor and are willing to give you smiles in the face of adversity. My biggest challenge in the commercial world was being hired by Hong Kong Television as their music video choreographer. I found the Chinese producers to have quite a different aesthetic than we do here in the States. So I learned to dig deep with the producers and ask them exactly what they wanted. If they wanted toys to dance, I made toys to dance. And if they wanted a tongue-in-cheek view of factory life, I did it. In this clip, they bust us out to Canton in China to work in this deserted factory. And when I saw it, I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do here? We had five hours in the factory, all the levels, all the smoke. I had to pull something together in five hours in an environment that I had never even seen before. I learned to understand exactly what was envisioned by the producers before I ever started choreographing it, and then choreograph it according to their vision. The biggest challenge was that I had no preparation time. I would be given a piece of music and 16 dancers at 8 in the morning and was told to be ready to film at noon and given what they wanted for their vision. For this kind of commercial work, even though it's a big no-no in the academic or artistic circles, I had to become formulaic. I had formulas for everything. A lot of them were formation changes that I just recycled. And sometimes I would just recycle material over and over again. Because if you have to do a four minute dance number in three hours, you just better learn to recycle. For a choreographer that is particularly artistic and expressive, the commercial world is really challenging. But you know, it is not that way for everyone. Some people are very good at making things up quickly off the top of their head. They're so fresh, they're so exciting, it just comes very natural. My friend Angelo Moyo is a choreographer like that, and I'd like for you to meet him. He's a commercial choreographer, been working in the commercial field for 20 years, more than 20 years. He's done television, he's done Las Vegas stage shows, he's done industrials, and this is a very natural environment for him. So let's hear from Angelo Moyo. What I never learned about choreography in school is how to choreograph for a commercial venue. It seems that most of the colleges across the country teach you how to choreograph for a concert setting. And of course all of that information is very valuable and you use that in, in everything that you choreograph. But in a commercial setting, uh, there's a lot of differences. Um, for example, in a concert setting, many times you get to choose your own music. Perhaps you have some emotional uh, theme that you want to explore. Well, that never happens in a commercial venue. In a commercial venue, you're handed a piece of music by the entertainment director or the producer of the show or even a client if you're doing some sort of business industrial. A client might hand you a piece of music and you have to come up with an entertainment 
to this music that might not move you in any way. So that's one of the tricks of, of being a commercial choreographer is you have to come up with certain steps and patterns and tricks that you use uh, that work in almost any business setting. So for example, uh, I think most choreographers that I know who work in a commercial venue, we all have our own little bag of tricks that always work for everything. So I mean, if you saw uh, an industrial that I did for PIP printing, and then another industrial that I did for you know Mutual of Omaha Insurance, you would notice a lot of the same styles in the choreography. Because I find that, you know, usually that kind of commercial uh, jingle will build to some sort of big crescendo and that's always a great time to have all of your dancers line up across the stage and do some sort of big kick line that usually brings the house down so that's one of those tricks that it's been used a million times but it always works and uh, especially when you're trying to do some sort of promotional motivational uh, entertainment another thing that I use a great deal of is I change patterns and formations a lot a lot more than using steps um, you know, you'll have the dancers slice through each other and then partner each other and then circle around each other and then go from a circle into a line into, and then cross the lines through each other. And so once you hear the music and you see what the phrasing of the music is, then you can figure out where your patterns and where your formations are going to go. And as long as you keep all the choreography moving, you don't really have to come up with a lot of uh, intricate steps. You just need to come up with a lot of movement to keep everything exciting to go with the music. Another thing that a commercial choreographer always has to keep in mind is the audience. Again, in a concert piece, a concert setting, many times you, you don't think about the audience so much because the piece is perhaps a bit more personal. You're trying to uh, explore or express an emotion through some music that really moves you. That's not the case in a commercial setting. In a commercial setting, you've got to always keep the audience in mind. You've got to remember that the only reason for this choreography and for these dancers to be on stage is to entertain the audience. So if you're not entertaining the audience, if somebody's chatting or talking or drinking and they're not paying attention to what's happening on stage, then you're not doing your job. Um, and I think that that's one of the big differences between what I learned in school and what I learned yeah, out in the field, is that you, when you first start choreographing in a commercial venue, you don't really think about the audience that much. But you realize very quickly that, you, that that's the most important thing when you're, when you're choreographing for a commercial venue, is that you've got to keep the audience in mind, you've got to make sure that they're entertained. So usually that means you have to keep everything very up, high energy. Uh, even if it's a lyrical piece, it has to have some sort of sparkle, some sort of uh, zip to it. It can't be depressing or morose or anything that's uh, of the darker emotions. It usually has to be pretty bright or you're going to lose your audience. I think another thing that's challenging when you're a commercial choreographer is uh, oftentimes you're, you're forced to work on an incredibly small space. And how do you make eight dancers look like they're moving everywhere when your space is this big? You know, that happens many times in television or in film work, but the big uh, plus that they have is that they can change camera angles, which gives them a different spatial quality. But when you're working in a proscenium show and you're just, the audience is sitting out there and you've got a stage this big and you've got eight dancers on there, then you're, the choreographer's problem is, how do I make the show keep moving? You have to change directions a great deal in a small space. Say, for, for, for instance, you know, you might do two or three counts of eight to the front and then have your dancers slice through each other, face another direction, do something that way, have them back through each other, cross this way, face front again. And so you've created some sort of stage movement, even though they've made, maybe only taken three or four steps from stage left to stage right, you know. But you have to try to figure out ways of, of keeping everything moving, even if it's on a small stage. And I find the best way to do that is to use a lot of direction changes in your choreography. Now we're going to go on to talk about personal work. Now for me, this is the real fun in choreography because frankly, I like to choreograph what I want to choreograph. So to me, this is the real good stuff. This is about discovering your own style, about becoming an autobiographical choreographer, and about what I call dancing from the inside out. Now to do this, you have to find things that resonate with you. For instance, what resonates with me really is second functional choreography. I do love design, but design, well, if it doesn't have meaning behind the movement, it just doesn't appeal to me as much. So I know what resonates with me is storytelling. 
I do so much storytelling in my choreography. Sometimes, yes, I do take this song literally, and I choreograph to the lyrics of the song. I try not to get too very literal. And then sometimes, maybe the uh, second functional message only really has meaning to me. It's not that it always has to be literal or a story everybody can see. Sometimes, I'm the only one that knows what I'm thinking, and it does look just like design. But to me, the motivation was second functional. This is mostly apparent in my modern or my lyrical pieces. Now in jazz, I just love good old-fashioned entertainment. One of the things that really resonates with me is using different cultures, the influence from different cultures in my choreography. I just like it. I like to look at different cultures and maybe I like the way their, their costumes look or their clothes or I like particular gestures or I like um, different elements from their folk dance or, you know, their traditional dances. I like to take those elements and put them into my jazz and lyrical choreography. Now this has been coined as world beat and I don't think it always has to even have the music from that culture. It can just be an influence from there. I'll show you some pieces that I've done this with. Latin jazz is always fun but for Latin you will have to teach your students some traditional steps such as the mambo that I show in this clip from the Mini Faces of Jazz. This would be a Latin jazz hip to the side. Now a mambo, traditional mambo, would cross behind with those type of hips. So when we see a mambo, traditionally, we'd see the hips in opposition like that. You can see that this lyrical number is influenced by the Spanish culture. I used arm shapes from traditional Spanish dance and also stylized the big ruffle skirts. The hairstyle, complete with a flower tucked into the tight bun, further accentuates the look. Spanish dance is very pulled up and has a lot of posturing, which I incorporated into the introduction of the piece. Here in Santa Fe, flamenco is very popular. I was lucky enough to get some private lessons and gain some knowledge of the basic flamenco stylings and then choreographed this number with fans to traditional flamenco music. In this piece, the musical break featured a sitar. So during that interlude, I used a Middle Eastern abdominal undulation like a belly dancer. In this piece, the music also had a Middle Eastern, almost Egyptian flavor, so I gave the dance a lot of angular, flexed movement and a bare midriff costume with lots of jewels. After 12 years of living in Hawaii, I of course became very familiar with the hula and the beautiful gestures of that dance form. One must be very, very careful about Hawaiiana, because truly the hula is not just a dance. Hula was the religion of the Hawaiian people. Because there was no written language in the Hawaiian Islands, hula was the way they kept record of their heritage through storytelling. Of course, there's a lot of contemporary hula today, and you might see that poolside at the Waikiki hotels. But hula is tricky. In choreographing this piece, I did obtain permission from my hula teacher to use some of the more contemporary gesture in a modern dance. Using ancient hula outside of its context and without permission is strictly taboo in Hawaii. This piece is more contemporary and is choreographed to a missionary song called Kanaka Vai Vai. This was initially choreographed as a liturgical piece for a Catholic church in Hawaii. Remember I said that you have to find things that resonate with you? Well, through the years, through all the years of choreographing and experimenting, I find that I am really drawn towards certain ways of working. And through the years, it has revealed um, certain patterns, stylistic signature patterns that I find are present in so much of my work. Now, to be completely truthful with you, 
I really didn't know about that until I started making these videos. And for months, believe me, for months, I've been looking at different clips throughout all the years of my choreographing, and I've been looking at these little clips, and I have started to see that there are patterns that come up in all of my dances. Maybe just two seconds of something, but I start to see that there's a thread of something that moves through all of my work, and that thread of something is the thing that's authentically me. With all respect to Doris Humphrey, I still like symmetry. Not all through the piece, but at times I find it calming and organized, and I like it. It's so natural for me to use it, but sort of disguise it with the time and space tools. After my discovery that I'd been using it so much, I did try to muscle my way through some pieces and not do it. But I never really did like them as much as the pieces where some type of symmetry is present. It must have really sunk in when my art teacher said that the circle is the strongest shape on the canvas because I see circles and circular movement present in so many of my pieces. Sometimes this has been totally unconscious. But usually, when I see the circle, it's my favorite part of the dance. In making up dance sequences for modern and lyrical, I love the use of fall and recovery or tension and release. It just feels good on my body, and I like the way it looks. So in reviewing and contemplating what common thread goes through many of my dances, I see the combre, the reach, and then the release everywhere. I also reconnected with something that I already knew about myself. I like tribal and even ancient archival movement. Maybe that's why I'm so drawn to circles and world beat movement. Here is another of my favorites, simple, beautiful port -de bras For me, a piece doesn't have to be complicated movement. It doesn't have to be triple turns and big exciting jumps all over the place to be wonderful. I really resonate towards simple movement with expressive line, especially in the port -de bras And then I build the complexity with time, space, and energy. Related to the port -de bras I am also very drawn to gesture. I just think it's so elegant. Like I said, I'm also very drawn to the use of level change and canon. I use unison intermittently, but it's really only to set off the contrast in the canons. Although I like the results of design in dance, for me the dance has to be second functional. I like dances that express universal deep feeling. I search for music that's so meaningful and wonderful that it could get an emotional response from the audience even if there weren't a dance to it. One of my favorite examples of this notion is the dance I did to Patchwork Quilt, the story of the AIDS quilt. Truthfully, I listened to this song for about two weeks before I could listen to it without crying. It's a very emotional song. Another example is the song Breaths, which is an enchantingly beautiful song. As you see, I use my circle, my port -de bras my gestural movement, level changes, and simple movement in canon. Oh boy, all of my favorites. These are all elements of my personal style. Now let's talk about how a choreographer finds that and develops it. In these days we have video. We're so lucky. We can review all of our pieces on video, sit on our couch in our living room, and just observe what we have done. And I think if you look at your body of work, everything from your jazz one pieces all the way to the most important works you've ever done, you will see in all of those pieces there is some thread that runs through them, maybe just a glimpse of something that runs through all of them. And when you look at it, you go, wow, that must really be authentically me. It's everywhere in my pieces. It could be something as, as simple as a gesture, or as simple as a way you take people on and off stage, or as simple as um, the way you use your pattern. Maybe you really like them to go in a loop before they do a particular jump. You'll see things that you've never thought of before. Now, this takes some exploration. These things don't come 
so easily. I mean, when we are artists, it takes the peeling away, like the layers of an onion. The layers of the onion might be things like, um, you know, the mundane things of our life, like, oh, yesterday I spent my whole day at the grocery store, and the day before that I spent my whole day doing my taxes, and the day before that I went to a convention, and I saw this little move that I really liked, and I want to remember what it is. All these things are layers, and when we peel away the layers, we start to see what authentically comes from ourselves. Now, when I talk about authentic, I mean, these are things we don't copy from somebody else. It's so easy to copy, and of course, when we have dance studios or we're choreographing all the time, of course, we're going to see a little thing here and a little thing there, and we like it, and we, oh, I'll remember that and put that in there. You know, I went to a dance convention last week, and I really like that, or MTV, I saw this little move that I like, and I'm going to yeah, stick it into this little part of my choreography, and of course, we all do that. But when we're talking about creating our own style and our own authentic, our own authentic personality in our choreography, we have to be very, very aware of what comes from us and what we are copying from someplace else. I want to talk about the deepest way of arriving at choreography, and I think that way is intuitive. And believe me, in school that word never came up. But we need to really understand that much of the work that comes out of us is intuitive. So how do we do that? First of all, we have to recognize that choreographing in this manner, we are choreographing as autobiographical choreographers. What does that mean? Well, when we're in school, taking a writing class, I remember the beginning of every writing class, the teacher says, if you want to be a, an author, if you want to be a writer, and you want to be good at it, you've got to write about what you know. And as choreographers, we have to dance about what we know. For instance, if I were to dance about being an African-American, just coming to the United States from Africa, and I wanted to do a lot of you know, African dance, it's just not me, it, it, you know, it's not that I couldn't do it if someone gave me that job, but you know, it's just not me and it probably wouldn't turn out as well as somebody who was an Afri African American, came over from Africa, knew the whole heritage, knew the whole vocabulary, had a connection with it, resonated with it. It just wouldn't be the same. And when we are doing choreography that is autobiographical, we have to have something that resonates with us. Now, I'm not saying we tell our life story. Sometimes things come out of you, and then afterwards you look at it, and you realize it came from a very intuitive place. Sometimes it happens after you do all your experimenting and all your improvising, and you look at it and go, wow. That is really me. That is really something that I resonate with. Now, just identifying those times, identifying through our body of work. Remember I talked about sitting on your couch and watching your body of work? Just identifying those things is the start of you becoming an autobiographical choreographer and the start of choreographing from an intuitive place. Now, I know this sounds all very mysterious and esoteric, but you know me, I'll have some pragmatic way to put it all into a structure, and I do. But I want to tell you that this is just my way of putting it into a structure so that I can tap into those intuitive places and, you know, I have a little strategy, a little, a little plan, plan A and plan B of how I can tap into that. These are my own little plans. Maybe they'll work for you. I'd like to tell you about them. Now, the first one Boy, I really had to overcome a lot of my fear about doing something that was taboo on this one because I learned in school, because I went to a first functional school, that dance exists for its own sake and it is not about the music. Well, I resisted the music for years and what I found out about myself is my ideas, my motivations, my inspirations are unleashed when I find the right piece of music. I can listen to hundreds of pieces of music and you know what, it's nothing. But then I hear that one song or that one interlude and I go, that's it. I know it because 
I see a vision unfold in front of me. Maybe it's a two-second vision. Maybe it's just like that fast. Maybe it's longer. But I start to see something. Now that vision is really nothing more than my imagination saying, you know what? You can do something with this. This resonates with you. You've got a storehouse, a storage of um, experiences, life experiences inside of you that somehow are going to be unleashed and come out when that song hits a certain um, harmonic or a certain something in the lyrics. There's some connection and you know we can't always intellectualize all these connections. You're going to know. For me when I hear that piece of music I feel like it's meant for me. I know I'm ready to go. After I find my piece of music though, I go right into my structure. I make my chart. Remember we talked about making those music charts? Because when I make my music chart and I see how that piece of music is structured and laid out, I can start to take my little visions and place them in different places in the chart and then I start to see how I can connect my little visions, how they all start coming together. Now, I want to comment on having those little visions and tell you how you can develop that. When I was a kid, along with my brother and sister, my mother used to play this little game with us. I'm sure it was just to calm us down, you know, we would be being rowdy and running around and, and my mother would say, it's time for eyelid theater. Well, eyelid theater was this little game my mother would play with us, and it could happen anywhere. It could happen, you know, when we were in the back seat of the car. It could happen if it was raining. It could happen at any time. So in eyelid theater, and you know what? This is a, a really profound practice, not just for little kids. In eyelid theater, we would close our eyes, and then the eyel our eyelids would become like this little theater, and we watch this little movie right here. It could be raining outside and we'd watch eyelid theater for a moment. Maybe we were in the back seat of the car. Watch eyelid theater for a moment. Tell my mother what we saw. Maybe my mother was telling us a story. We would close our eyes. We'd watch eyelid theater. We'd watch that story go by. Maybe my mom would put on a piece of music. We'd watch eyelid theater. Now here's what I found out about the music. Most of the time to the music, I was bored out of my mind. I, I lit theater, no movie came on. But sometimes a piece of, you know, we did it with the radio. Sometimes a piece of music would come on and boom, a whole world opened up for me. And then I wouldn't really watch it on my eyelids anymore. When that came on, I'd stare at the wall. And just, I'd like go into a trance or something. And I could see the whole thing unfold. I think this was tapping into, at a very early age, tapping into some type of intuition. There is some way to connect from here to there. And with me, it was with the music. If that music hit me, it would flood, it would just come right out. Now I want to suggest Island Theater, not only for us grown-ups, as a meditational practice, but something that we practice with our students. This is something that with practice becomes more and more and more vivid. Now I think art, art on any level, there's an element of it that comes from someplace else. And this is why I can really appreciate, remember when we talked about Doris Humphrey in the last video and she said, don't intellectualize? This is where I can really appreciate that comment because sometimes when we intellectualize and we just muscle it out of our minds to do that choreography, we lose the ability to tap into our intuition that connects us with that someplace else. I know, it sounds so esoteric and it sounds so new agey and you know what, it is. And this is probably why we don't talk so much about intuition in our academic programs because I think there'd be an, a lot of eye rolling going on. But for me, I can tell you honestly, the pieces that I'm most proud of, that I most connect with, the pieces that I think will really stay with me all my life and as I review them I go, gosh, I'm so glad I did that. They all came from places like eyelid theater or they came from places like visualizing. They all came from that connection with the someplace else. I want you to meet a choreographer who I think is one of the most innovative and intuitive choreographers I've ever met. His name is Robert Stivers.
And Robert's a very good friend of mine, and I've watched him work a lot with dancers. And I can tell you truly, when I go in to choreograph a piece, I've got all my charts, I've got all my notes, I've got everything on there. When Robert walks in, he might not even have the music. He comes from such an intuitive place. It really works for him. And in contrast to myself and Audrey and Angelo, I think you'll find him extremely interesting. What motivates me in, in my choreography is a desire to communicate often a feeling, a spirit, an attitude, um, a sense of what it's like to be human. If it's, if it's an idea of love, for instance, I won't literally work with love and romance in a pas de deux necessarily. That may happen, but the gesture, the movement, the music, um, the lighting will, have to, will be very internal and very private, very subtle. The process also of choreographing in the studio is very organic. I'm not one who has a clear notion or a clear picture of exactly how it's going to unfold. I like to in integrate a little bit of improv with the dancers. I enjoy sometimes getting their feedback. No, I enjoy getting their feedback. I will always um, have final say though. I may even go and into the studio without a choice of music and work with movement and let it unfold and then find the music that will be appropriate for the movement. I try to go in with as much of an open mind as possible because it seems that when I close myself off to certain ideas I might lose the opportunity for magic to unfold, and I'm a great believer in letting magic or serendipity um, chance unfold with work. So I give the dancers a basic sense of what the movement will be. I, have to, I always experiment with it on my body, and then I might say to the dancers, what can you do with this? Can you, can you magnify it? Can you reduce it? Can you play with it? Can you improv with it? Can you completely, can you do it reverse, backwards? Can you change the counts to it? Um, and then I see, I watch it unfold, and if it's of interest to me, I let it develop. If it's not, I go in a completely different direction. I really am, I'm very interested too in not doing something that is familiar. I'm trying to find my own voice with choreography. To me, it's an art form. Um, it's not about entertainment, it's not about exhibitionism, it's not about winning awards, it's not, you know, I really, um, even though I want the audience to appreciate it, it's not really about audience approval. Uh, I want to do something that, at least to me, feels profound and real and honest and is new or fresh or exploring or experimental. How I come up with my movement. It's, I think, a combination of what my body will do, how I can still move, which is somewhat limited, which is pretty limited now because of, of injuries and I'm not the youngest guy around anymore. It's a combination of that and also experiment. I think there's a certain, at times, now I don't mean to contradict myself, but there's a certain goofiness of things I can do. In addition to there's a certain lyricism that I have. And I may say, okay, here's a movement that may seem kind of odd or awkward, but how can you integrate this with something that is beautiful and lyrical? And how can we bring those two together to create a third or a greater, um, a, a greater third movement? I'm also a fine art photographer. In fact, that is probably uh, my main source of income and my main career at present. My first love is always dance and choreography. I think they work harmoniously together. Um, with the still images, I'm very concerned about light and shape, um, movement, nuance, subtlety, communicating a, a feeling through gesture. 
And what I love about choreography is I get to ha let that allow that happen in space and time. Photography informs my choreography as much as the choreography informs my photography. I have to, to, to a certain extent, not let it be too intellectual or too thoughtful because what that does is it almost impedes me. It almost becomes counterproductive. I let it happen on kind of a, on a very interior level, a very emotional level. So now, for instance, in my photographic work, I've done a lot of work by throwing things out of focus, for instance. Now, that may happen on stage by having movement that is maybe very slow, maybe it's, it's an adagio of sorts, but it will kind of go from one movement to another almost as if a camera is clicking the shutter. I'm also dealing with, now with photography, I'm exploring a very graphic sense of, of black and white and it's very large so in a new piece that might be coming up I might be creating movement that is something that's larger than life just as my earlier work might be something that's very 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 subtle if I can capture something that's just a hand on the face or the closing of the eyes or, the, or a subtle quiet movement going across stage these are all incredibly integrated for me.